Okay, let's warm up. A little bit about JavaScript itself. Yeah, so JavaScript needs an environment that it could be running. Yeah, so uh, uh, typically we very often we use a, a browser for that. Browser has this um, V8 engine um, that provides a runtime environment for JavaScript to run. It is initially uh, implemented with C language. Okay, and uh, it has uh, two types of memory handling, and the first one is called call stack. Um, this is the area where JavaScript running engine knows uh, what what kind of code will be, will be running. It knows uh, method frames, primitive values, uh, pointers to the real objects. Okay, and it is known at compile time, so we know uh, the size of it is known at compile time. So basically, before starting the application. Uh, it is already know how what kind of side this uh, call stack has. Okay, and we have a, a heap memory where it's more dynamic. It uh, contains the real objects, uh, functions, and yeah, basically it is pointed by the uh, stuff in the call stack. And one important thing to notice there is that with engine has only one call stack, so meaning that JavaScript is synchronous. It can fulfill one thing at a time. Okay. Let's try to investigate its in action. How call stack works. Okay, so we have this really simple um, string fancy fire where we put a stuff into the our function, we add a prefix with fancy string and just print out. And yeah. How it uh, how it behaves. So firstly, we start our main function, right? Um, we put it in the call stack for execution. But firstly, we need to read through all the code. Okay, we add a fancy stuff into a call stack. Uh, fancy fancy print. Sorry, and fancy print it has a other method call uh, called make fancy. Add that too, and in the make fancy function, we have instantaneously a return method with a fancified input. And from this part, we're starting starting to eliminate stuff from the call stack and start executing it. We returned, fancified our input, put console log call into the call stack, and immediately it was executed. We have fancy stuff, okay? and continue until our call stack is empty. And this is a very trivial example how JavaScript uh, works um, in the V8 engine using a call stack. And this is uh, the place where we uh, execute our stuff synchronously. Okay. But what if we want to run multiple things at the same time? We want to call external APIs, we want to query databases, we want to read files and write two files, and most importantly, we want to wait for the responses in a non-blocking manner. So meaning that if we query a database, we don't want to block our server, for example, if we implement a Node.js server, JavaScript-based server, we want other users to, to welcome and to not block them. Okay, um, so before diving in how to how we can do this in Node.js, let's um, remember what asynchronity actually is. Okay, so yeah, there is this multi-threading concept where we have this um, processes that can run independently um, in the CPU. Basically, uh, it, it's the kind of orchestration of uh, app pieces that could work independently, right? So there is two flavors of uh, multi-threading in the CPU level. We have this traditional one where we, for example, we have one CPU and there's not a real multi-threading here, more like um, asynchronity, I mean, um, because uh, it, it's, uh, it happens on a single CPU and it's only a virtual multi-threading where we um, execute our program but it's being executed um, basically synchronously in the CPU level, but it looks like it's being uh, splitted into uh, several parts and um, due to CPU clocking mechanisms, it looks like it happens uh, uh, synchronously. 
And we have a station where we have a couple of CPUs and where we actually execute code uh, in parallel. And most, most often these two styles are combined. Okay, so the thread itself, yeah, it's a small piece of a programming instructions that could uh, be run uh, independently from each other and uh, using yeah, CPU resources and operating with the same memory. It can write and read through the same file. And this is where the problem uh, problems could happen. Okay, so uh, let's imagine a situation if uh, one thread tries to uh, modify a memory piece, uh, a file, right? And the other thread tries to write into it, uh, another thread tries to read from it, or two of them tries to write from it. So it could end up in corrupted data. Okay, and, and to solve these kind of issues uh, in traditional asynchrony, uh, we use uh, uh, synchronized flags, for example, in Java, okay, to, to, to lock a resource. So, so basically we are giving priority to uh, one thread instead of another, yeah. And uh, this kind of situations could end up in deadlocks where we are, where resource is kind of blocked by uh, access to the resources blocked by several layers and there's a queue of threads that waiting for it yeah and thread monitoring and, and other issues and basically if we decide to implement a synchronous program that uses synchronity multi-threading uh, it is uh, it requires a really careful design and architectural decisions so it's kind of tricky and it could end up a lot of pitfalls. So, yeah. Another example could be a traditional server uh, that, for example, on some Tomcat yeah, on Java side, where we uh, create a thread for every um, user request. So basically, there is a server which runs, right, and it accepts the requests. And if there is, yeah, a thread in the thread pool, it takes this thread assigns it to the request and executes the code. So, and yeah, so basically a thread per user. And typically scalability in this kind of servers are being achieved um, by increasing the threads number. Yeah, more threads, more uh, dead ra uh, more, more racing issues where we could encounter deadlocks and stuff like that that we discussed before. Okay, and what about Node.js? Uh, firstly, let's uh, remember what Node.js is. Yeah, it's an uh, open source, cross-platform, backend, Java, script, runtime, environment. Uh, pretty similar uh, as in um, in browsers, yeah, where we execute JavaScript code, but uh, Node.js itself is kind of designed to allow developers to develop servers, not uh, front-end applications. And it's the same, same V8 engine but outside the web browser. And we previously uh, talked about how JavaScript uh, is synchronous. It runs on a single thread. It has one call stack. And how, how about Node.js? So answer is yes and no. Trick, right? But hold on. So yes, it's that in the sense that it still has one call stack. It can execute synchronous stuff in the call stack. And no, but it, it allows execute a CPU intensive work uh, without uh, uh, blocking uh, code in a call stack. So it can behave asynchronously. And I guess, uh, yeah, most important question here, can we support server-like applications without necessity of maintaining threads, those asynchronous issues that we saw before? And the answer is yep. We can do it. Okay, so how we can execute a synchronous code in a single threaded environment? Okay, so with this slide, the warm up is over. We can exercise now. Main workout libuv. What is it? Libuv. Again, it's a C library, originally written for Node.js to abstract non-blocking input-output operations kind of dry sentence, but I'll try to explain it. Uh, basically, libuv helps us with operating uh, with the file system, uh, with the streaming, networking, stuff like that, HTTP requests, 
but it, it allows to for operating system to handle these things uh, in the background and uh, JavaScript itself uh, doesn't doesn't do this this stuff. It it it, uh, it, it runs on Node.js, and Node.js has support for LibView library, so it's built-in stuff into Node.js. Okay, um, LibView has this thing called event loop, which is uh, in a nutshell a single thread which loops all the time and listens for the incoming request. If, for example, is it's a, a server, a Node.js server. It waits for those requests, registers them, and gives all the work for the libv library, that OS stuff, to communicate with all systems, um, HTTP request, and stuff like that. And in the meantime, uh, we can execute a call stack, synchronous stuff, while libv handles all the synchronity. And we have this thing called event queue. What is it? Basically, um, when uh, we assign a blocking task to the libv by event loop, we create these things called callbacks. And when when the synchronous stuff is, is done or failed, for example, we put a callback into the event queue for it to be executed later. So basically, it's an indication that something happened with the asynchronous code. Yeah, I talk about a lot about callbacks, but okay, what are they? We're gonna use uh, an example with FS library. It's a built-in Node.js module which uh, allows uh, interaction with file systems. Okay, so this is uh, how it, it would like if we try to read a file, a grocery list, for example, and assign a callback to that read file method. Okay, so this is a callback. So basically a callback is a a function like a contract which will be executed only when the read file method is uh, complete, failed or succeeded. Okay, so often it is, uh, uh, sometimes it will be a misunderstanding if uh, often by the junior developers that uh, this callback thing is a uh, code that will be executed asynchronously. That is not true. Asynchronous stuff is only here. This is only the one place where the libv takes action. It communicates with operating system, reads file, and has uh, this contract with our JavaScript code through Node.js uh, that please libv uh, let us know when you're done and allow us to see the output of this code when you're done. So this callback. So this is synchronous code that will be put into the call stack and executed synchronously. Okay, more advanced example of uh, fancy fire, but this time using Node.js. Okay, so uh, what I added is uh, the only thing here. It's the same example as we saw before, but this time, it, in addition to printing out the fence fired input, it saves the input into the file.txt file. Okay, so let's, let, let's see how it behaves. So yeah, we have this event loop, which listens all the time when Node.js started. We start by executing our main, code, put, let's put it in the call stack. Then we have our fancy print stuff. We instantaneously go into inside of it, add to file. And this is the place where the magic starts to happen. To file, calls write file method, leave the we under the ground. And when we start to execute it, it puts the write file request in for the libv we to, to complete. But since it's not the work of the call stack, we can remove it from the call stack and start executing what is the remaining uh, stuff in the call stack itself. We can go to the fancy input, put the console log into the call stack, print that out as previously, empty our call stack, okay, and we're kind of done here. 
but still event loop still loops. There is this one single thread that listens for the call stack queue. And at some point of time, libv will complete its job and write input into the file. And as we talked before, there is a contract called callback that will be registered into the callback queue, put into the callback queue. And event loop, as I said, iterates and listens if there is a uh, something in this queue. And if there is, it puts it into the call stack. And we can start executing it, executing it and print out that file is saved. And this is how we empty our call stack and, and our application. Yeah, so we just saw an example with a file system, uh, this built-in Node.js module file system. There are other things that can we that we could use for these uh, non-blocking operations. This is a HTTP built-in module for communicating with server and client, creating a client. Also, we have a support for the cryptography. Okay, but what about other CPU intensive tasks? Um, for those who are not related with file system, HTTP, cryptography. For example, if we want to implement something in the pure JavaScript language and we don't want to block our call stack, something serious like calculating sand grains that are in a bucket. Okay, look at the quotes I added, not very serious, okay. But it could happen. For some reason, we could uh, could want to uh, implement a very CPU-intensive function that uses JavaScript code that's not supported by the these uh, libwe magics. Okay, so this is a very simple code which iterates through the it has a loop while loop. It iterates 10 billion times and just prints out that yeah, I'm done. Um, it's trivial, but it could block our call stack because it could because it could take some time to, to be executed. For example, at 10 seconds, and and 10 seconds in server is really huge number, right? If you block our call stack for 10 seconds, and the server cannot fulfill incoming requests for 10 seconds, it's it's bad. So okay, so what if you really want to use multiple threads with Node.js? Okay, we need to put this non-blocking JavaScript code into threads to, for really to be unblocking, right? Okay, so our next main workout will be our working threads. What are they, those working threads? Before identifying for the R, let's remember how asynchrony is being handled in a traditional manner. So yeah, um, threads created in traditional manner has this thing called shared context, uh, where we need to control race conditions that could yeah, result in corrupted data. Racing conditions, the, the example I used when I spoke about of writing into the file and write, uh, reading from the file, where we need to lock certain resources so that they, they could be prioritized for certain threads. Okay, worker threads modules um, basically don't do that. They don't have concept of shared context here. And trying to implement a multi-threading without breaking uh, the JavaScript uh, laws. Well, basically, uh, multi-threading is not being implemented in the JavaScript language like we have a, a Java or C. And how, how does that? Um, so yeah, the main thing is that workers, the threads runs in complete isolation, okay? When we create a thread, in Node.js, we run it in isolation. And threads itself, a uh, parent thread, the, 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 the code that creates a child thread can, uh, and vice versa, can communicate with these called channels, message channels, by serializing data. So basically, if uh, threads want to communicate, they make uh, uh, copies of, of data. So there is no real uh, race conditions. So how does that? So yeah. Each worker, each thread, in this situation has its own V8 engine instance and event loop and libv support. So basically a little small environment for thread to run in, in isolation. Yeah, and as I said before, 
parent worker and child worker can communicate via these messaging channels. And for example, said that, yeah, parent, I'm done. Okay, work, okay, child, take this data and execute it. And when you're done, and when you're done inform me about it. But yeah, we are message channels. Okay, um, let's go back to our sand grains, grains calculation example and try to put it in a worker thread. So put it in the service.js file first, okay? And add some, some source to it. What I did there is just added a built-in working threads import. And instead of printing out the console log message, I added this uh, messaging channel call that I mentioned before for informing the parent worker about the completion of, 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 this, of this code. So basically, uh, whoever executes this code, creates a thread out of it, will be informed via this message channel that this thread is, is done. Okay, we need a code to execute this, this child. Let's create a parent. Import a working thread in the parent as well. There is this run service. Um, it just popped out, but yeah, stay with me. It's nothing really fancy here. We just create a new promise. Inside of promise, we create a new worker instance by pointing to the code uh, that is in the service.js file. And the and working data parameter is yeah, uh, input to the child worker to work with. Okay, and uh, in addition to that, we start listening for the events that will uh, come from the, the child worker. So in this case, we're gonna listen to the message event. And the message event will be fired when the child yeah, basically uh, informs something through the messaging channel. And it prints out that, yeah, the child is done. And we addition, in addition to that, we're listening for the error event. If something unexpected happens, it just, yeah, rejects the, the whole promise. And yeah, there is this um, little piece of code to, to execute the run service. Okay, let's try to see how it would look if we start it in the console. Yeah, so we have this application, main application indication that it's starting a worker and it actually starts the worker with the input one bucket that would be our volume where we calculate our sand and instantaneously after that we're gonna yeah do something really really important yeah in this in this case we just yeah blah 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 doing something fancy mm -hmm. yeah so if we start to execute it application instantaneously yeah, start the worker and start the run service and instantaneously it prints that they are doing something fancy and the meanwhile run service uh, calculates these sand grains and yeah we are kind of unblocked in the main thread in the parent thread and we can do other stuff in a blocking manner and some point of time the child will say that I'm done. So yeah so this is how we implement could implement the um, CPU intensive task writing the pure JavaScript code and it is allowed by working threads module. Okay, that was some stuff that we discussed. Let's summarize it. Okay, so yeah, Node.js have this um, call stack where we, com where we um, can execute a blocking code. Yeah, single thread, one item by the time, and if it has a call for the library, it just yeah signs it and uh, continues and yeah so library we this uh, C library that is uh, that supports input and output operations as so HTTP requests uh, file file modifying files reading from it and cryptography and stuff like that and yeah it put the uh, callbacks back into the call stack for execution via callback queue. And yeah, we talked about this uh, working thread module, um, which allows to execute CPU intensive tasks in uh, writing the real JavaScript code in complete isolation of a, of a thread where we, can, we not necessarily need to deal with uh, all this uh, multi-threading complexity. 
Okay, and one bonus point that uh, yeah, if we need a lot of this kind of CPU intensive tasks in Node.js, so that I guess we need to consider if it is a, if it is a really um, good decision because yeah, Node.js is basically built for handling uh, input and output operations, and we need we need to be focused on libv stuff and take advantage of it. So yeah, if we are planning to use something for crypto mining or stuff like that, I guess we should consider the programming languages as well. Yeah, um, yeah, and I guess that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the presentation, Gedros. Um, and we have quite a few questions. So I quite liked your framework warming up, so I have warming up question for you as well. Uh, so first question. Why Node.js were called language? Why it's called language? Yeah, because yeah. there, there is a JavaScript and there is Node.js, and everyone's calling JavaScript a language. So why do you think Node.js is a language? Well, yeah, it would be more accurate to call it a environment where the actual language is being <laughs> executed. OK, yeah, so I don't know. Well, actually, I think it's because, yeah, it feels like a new language, I guess. It uh, has a lot of built-in stuff, and it, a lot of people use it for server development. I don't know. My honest, I guess, answer is that it feels like a language, and stick like yeah. that. Yeah. OK, awesome. All right, the, the next one. How big the Node.js team in Telesoftus does the team embrace as TypeScript for projects? Yeah, um, Node.js team still have, well, in, in recent years, we grew a lot. Uh, I don't know the exact number, but yeah, um, I would say about yeah, 30 or more people now developing uh, using Node.js. And yeah, we, we enforce, yeah, we respect the TypeScript. Uh, it's kind of good tool for um, controlling, um, uh, to keep a control in in, in teams. I, I believe that if we uh, use a JavaScript, it's kind of good, pure JavaScript, it's kind of good for prototyping things, and uh, TypeScript allows to to control, um, to to have uh, uh, saved knowledge for, for the types that I used in the project so that we avoid some, some problems, some com compiling errors with the new features. So, yeah, in an OGS, uh, Platform. We have this thing called platform. We we respect TypeScript. All right. Great answer. Thanks. Um, the next one. Is it possible to use a sync await syntax instead of callbacks? Instead of callbacks. Um, well, <laughs> in a nutshell, um, we're still going to use in callbacks. Yeah, we're going to promisify something inside a code that will be executed asynchronously. Um, but the real callback function, yeah, I guess uh, in a visual manner we can avoid writing that. But still, we have a callback running some here, somewhere in the background. But from yeah, controllability reason, I believe, yes, we can write pretty, pretty well-readable code with a sync and a wait stuff, so yeah. My answer, I guess, would be yes, but we need to, to think about that callback that still there are some somewhere. Yeah, I guess you, you can feel the trend that uh, everything is moving towards the async await syntax, but that's definitely a part of what it is. And the last of the hard questions, uh, what were the biggest challenges, pitfalls, when developing solutions with Node.js? Yeah, so I guess one of the recent issues that we encountered was streams, where we need to pipe things from one stream to another. Yeah, so there was some 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 stuff to, to debug, and yeah, it's sometimes complicated to test these things. So uh, streaming knowledge and piping and all this uh, stream transform stuff is a really good thing to focus on when we know to learn 
more about Node.js, how useful it is. And yeah, I think streaming, piping, these are the hard nuts, I guess. All right. That's a nice thing. We're going to have a presentation just about that. Um, and uh, for the cooldown, it's not actually uh, a question, more of a statement. It says, Gathers, be best wishes from your classmate, Ignas Tonis. <laughs> Raseini loves you. So <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Gedrus, for, for the presentation. Thank you.